welcome. I'm Monica Price and you're watching Cuppa TV. On today's show, I will be joined by Costas Patro, a young motivational speaker who shares his incredible story of rags to riches. Also with me today is a lady that works tirelessly to support and help women surviving breast cancer. With their local based charity, they support women across the West Midlands. Veronica Cumitar and her guest Yvonne Sinclair. My first guest today is someone who's had to endure tremendous hardship and adversity to become the man he is today. He was homeless at the age of 17 and eating just one meal a day was a blessing to him. Let's hear his story. Please welcome Costas Petro. Costas, thank you so much for coming on Thank Cup you TV. very much for having me. Wonderful to see you here today. And you too. What a story. Where do we begin, Costas? <laughs> Wherever you want from the beginning. <laughs> well, I mean, you, um, you had such an adverse start to your, to your life. Perhaps we'll start there. Tell us, tell us your story. Yeah. Um, my father was a, was a British champion boxer in 1985. Now, for most, m most children growing up with a champion father, that's naturally going to make you a little bit different. Um, and, and it was no different for me. Mm. Going through high school, I was tremendously bullied for that fact that my father was a boxer, he was a champion. People naturally wanted to try and challenge me. And, mm. and I was a very small and, and innocent child, if, if you like. You know, I never really wanted to cause much trouble. I just wanted to be within my own little zone mm. and do my thing. But um, I, got, I got very badly bullied. Um, most days it was just a struggle just to walk home because I was beating up that bad. And that, in essence, took me away from my dream. My dream was to become a professional footballer. Really? Yeah. Mm. I worked tirelessly to try and make that happen. I would literally go onto that field for hours and hours all by myself mm. and risk getting beaten up because they would know I'm there. And most days I was running off tr trying to get away from these mm. guys. And, and in essence, what happened from there was I went from having this dream of becoming a professional footballer, working so hard, getting to the level where I was playing for uh, a very well-established youth team mm. in the Midlands. And from that point, I found out that a couple of the bullies from school had joined the football club because naturally they were talented also. Mm. And, and the problem with that was it, they, they bullied me out of the team and I ended up saying, you know, enough's enough, I can't take this anymore. Um, I remember the moment when that happened, one of them threw me up against the wall after a football match mm. and just said, if you don't leave the team, we're going to kill you. Gosh, I mean, that's incredible. I mean, just that alone is just incredible. I mean, what, what drove you then to continue with your goal? Well, what happened from then was mm. I, I said, to, you know, I said, I've gone through enough of this now. It was, mm. I, I think people get to a breaking point. Everyone has their breaking point. And I got to the point at that age where I just thought I can't take this anymore. So I said, I ain't, I ain't going to proceed with football as much as I love football. And it was absolutely devastating for me to walk away from my dream as a person. You know, it's very brave of you to do that at such a young age. It was, it was an unbelievable thing for me to do because my father also, who was successful in the sport, had big, big hopes for me. Mm. And naturally, I could never tell my dad that I was being bullied. I would always hide it. I, he never knew anything. You know, I don't even think he had an inkling that I was being bullied because I was so well at hiding it. And the reason for that is because he, was a, he wasn't just a champion boxer. He was quite hot-headed, and I, I was more scared of what his reaction would be if he found out. Mm. So I kept it from him. So when I walked away from football, you know, he could not believe it. The word quit does not register with him. He'd never quit in his life on anything. And he thought that his son had just quit on something, but he didn't, it, I, because of myself, he didn't know the true extent of the story. And that, that led to me and him clashing tremendously, which then led to even more, you know, catastrophic events, if you like, in my life. And is that when you left home? Is that when you chose to leave? Because That's right. At that point then, I walked, you know, we was going, through, my dad was already going through, you know, other, other mm. situations, mm. and we, we was, arguing quite a bit mm. due to the fact that he had big hopes for me as, as, a, as a naturally as a parent he wanted the best for me and he thought that I'd just walked away to and in his mind just just to do nothing just to just to bounce around he didn't realize mm. the full extent of what happened and it was like torture for me because my father was literally my idol my hero you know naturally him being I think most kids who have yes. a father figure in their life would feel that way but the fact that my dad was a champion mm. He was so well respected. He'd be stopped in the street and asked for his autograph. You know, seeing that as a kid, he was my hero. So having that person constantly clashing with me was just a bit too much for me to bear. And it got to the point where I said, I'm, I'm walking away now. I'm walking away from everything. I'm walking away from football. I'm walking away from my home. 
and I'm just going to break out and just and just venture into the world. And where did you go? Well, I was 17 years old. I was so innocent. I hadn't got a clue about life and what was what was around the corner. And I, I just remember walking around for hours. And I walked local to where my my great granddad lived. And near the school that I was where I was living, uh, where I went to school. Sorry. And I walked around about two and a half miles from where my home was at that time. And it got dark and I saw this building and I thought, what am I going to do? It got to the realisation set in mm. and it was like, where do I go from here? I've got nowhere to go. And I thought to myself, you know, just, just sleep rough for a little while. It's going to be OK. You know, you don't realise at that point that it's going to actually take a lot longer to get yourself back on your feet. And I ended up looking over my shoulder. It was starting to throw down with rain. It was dark. And I just saw this building, this abandoned, derelict building. And I thought that's going to have to do. Where else can I go? I don't want to sleep on the street. I'd rather at least have some kind of roof over my head. Mm. But, um, you know, the, the experiences that I went through at that point, mm. from that moment onwards, I don't think I'd wish on my worst enemy, let alone, you know, a 17-year-old kid. And how long did you stay homeless for? How long were you there for? It was approximately one year, mm. around, you know, that's just over time, one year. Pastors. Yeah, it was a long time. Mm. Um, I had many experiences. I saw my eyes open to the world at that point. You know, I was surrounded by drug addicts. I was surrounded by thieves. I was even surrounded by, you know, murderers. And was there no contact with your family at that time? Very, very little. Again, I've, I kept a lot from my family. I told my family that I was, I was staying with a friend over the way. I never wanted my family to know that actually I, I am going downhill. I ain't, I ain't on the right track. I never wanted them to know that. I always wanted my family to feel proud of me. So I kept a lot from them. So when, they, when I would see them, it would be a case of, yeah, I'm suffering with my friend and everything's going well and I'm getting myself on track. But the fact of the matter is, nothing was on track. I had no home. I had no food most days. Yes, I mean, what did you do for food and money? Did you... The, How the, did you cope? the only time I had a, I'd do favors for my, I'd do a favor for my friend, which in, in essence actually led to me getting stabbed. I'd done a, a, I'd done a favor for my friend one day when he asked me to deliver an envelope mm -hmm. for his sister's birthday, and he said, "I'll give you a five if you can do it for me because I'm working all day." And I said, "Sure, why not?" And on the way there, I was walking through an alleyway, and whilst walking through that alleyway, I was attacked by three guys, and and one of them stabbed me, and in he stabbed me in the arm. And as I turned around towards him, he came in directly towards my chest with a knife. He was trying to kill me in that moment, all for an envelope. Just, I mean, what was going through your mind at that time? I mean, you must uh, have been just so yeah. scared. I say, I say this in a lot of my motivational yeah. talks. Two thoughts come to my mind in that moment, which I've actually learnt to apply mm. to any challenge in my life. Mm. And then two thoughts in that moment were, how much do I want to survive? and what do I need to do to survive? Mm -hmm. And how I apply that to my life now is, when I'm approached with a challenge, how much do I want to actually overcome this challenge? Mm -hmm. And what do I need to do to overcome this challenge? Mm -hmm. And them two questions taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. They helped me through. But it was after being stabbed, mm -hmm. the most amazing thing happened to me after being stabbed the first time. I had two amazing experiences, both after being stabbed, believe it or not. Really? Yeah, the first time I was walking back, I was so visi visibly shook up. I was looking around everywhere because I didn't know if these guys were going to jump out on me again. And as I was looking around, I caught a glimpse of a brick wall, which was filled with graffiti. And it's unbelievable that this message was just on this brick wall, but it just seemed to really strike home with me. And, it's simp and I say this again in my talks when I'm speaking to groups of, of youngsters or, or anyone really, mm. It doesn't matter what's happened to you. What matters is what are you going to do about it? Mm. And that's, mm. what, that's what I learned to take on board. That's what you do now. And what inspired you at that time to just you know, get out of the situation you were in, Costas? How long were you homeless for? Just, just, on, just over one year. Yeah. And I think what inspired me was I never, ever, ever had the thought in my mind that this was going to be permanent. Mm. See, the thing is, I had a vision. And every now and then when I felt down, I'd step out of this vision. I step into this vision and say, you know, this is where I'm going to be. You know, it's, this isn't for, forever. But what really, really changed my life was when I was stabbed for the second time and I was stabbed in my head here. Mm. And after, ha after having stitches, I, I, I went back to this abandoned building where I was staying. And I was living on this torn to shreds, sleeping on this torn to shreds mattress. It was just ripped to shreds. And I got there and I sat on this mattress and I just collapsed backwards. And I remember putting my hands over my face and it felt like I was going in slow motion. And as I removed my hands from my face, I don't know what this experience was, but I was just, now I was outside 
in a, it, like, it felt like a, a black cloud that I was sucked into. I needed to be uncomfortable, so I had the, the need big enough to change. And that's why I bought these books. I kept myself on, on the tips of my toes, you know, like, I kept myself on edge, and I read and I read and I read, and I educated myself. And from that point, I was able to, to just climb and climb slowly up the ladder to become the number one person ever. Yes, you became the for number the one salesman for your company. That's right. Yes. And from that position, I met my fiance, who I'm getting married to in June. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, and Congratulations. thank you very much. <laughs> and it's going to be a big fat Greek wedding. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> I'd be able to have one, absolutely. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and believing and yourself would, enough. That's amazing. Well, it's just been an absolute pleasure to meet you, Costas. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. And I wish you every success for your wedding. Bless you. Thank Sounds you wonderful. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now, the number of women in the UK being diagnosed with breast cancer is increasing. However, the survival rate is improving. Still, though, every year nearly 55,000 women are diagnosed in the UK. That's the equivalent of 150 people every day, or one person every 10 minutes. Staggering statistics. I'm joined today by Veronica Kimata, a lady who spends her life trying to help those women with support, practical advice and help when it's needed with her charity Ladies Fighting Breast Cancer. We're also joined as well with cancer survivor Yvonne Sinclair. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for coming on Copper TV. So I'm going to start with you, Veronica. Mm -hmm. um, well, how did the charity start? The uh, charity was started by myself and the late Sue Masters when our friend Carol Nags was diagnosed with breast cancer in June 2000. Mm -hmm. And, and from there, do, do, how did you, what, what, was it something you, you always wanted to do? No, what happened was when Carol was diagnosed, we really didn't know what to do and mm -hmm. we wanted just to offer her some support. Mm -hmm. So we took ourselves down to see her doctor at the QE hospital mm -hmm. and was asking him questions and how could we help and how could we support Carol. And the doctor asked me what would I feel if I was diagnosed with breast cancer, what would really upset me. And I immediately said losing my hair and then mm. apologised as soon as I said it because mm. I said, I'm sorry, that sounds very vain. Mm. And he said to some women, that's really, mm. really important. Mm. So I asked the question, is there anything that I could possibly buy that would stop this from happening? And he said, yes, you could buy me a £5,000 cooling cap. Mm. So I walked out of the hospital thinking, OK, I'm now going to have to raise £5,000 mm. to buy a cooling cap. And that's how it began. And that's how it began. I mean, it's staggering statistics, isn't it? I mean, you know, 150, what do I say? You know, it's just staggering statistics. Mm -hmm. and why do you think um, the survival rate, though, is, is improving? I think because of diagnosis, we're getting mm -hmm. better at diagnosing women. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it's education. This is what the charity is all about, mm -hmm. is to go out there and educate people that early detection saves lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what we're very passionate about, is... Uh, getting women to start mm. checking themselves on a regular basis. And Yvonne, you've joined us today. Um, you are a cancer survivor with breast cancer, of course. Um, tell us your story, Yvonne. I, I was diagnosed in September 2013. Mm. It was just a routine mammogram I went for, mm. and on my holiday came back, a letter and went back, and I just didn't realise how serious it actually was. Mm. And I ended up um, having a double mastectomy in the October. Mm and hopefully everything's all clear i'm just on like tablets mm. now for five years and then and i had chemotherapy radiotherapy and as mm. i say i'm very fortunate that i'm sort of like still looking very well mm. or maybe better yes, than, I did, be <laughs> better yeah. than yeah. I did before yeah. it's marvelous do, yeah. do you feel how did you get involved with ladies fighting breast cancer um, they had a, a stand in the atrium at the QE mm -hmm. actually and mm -hmm. I just sort of walked up and asked if they were advertising for volunteers and Verani Veronica was amazed that mm. I just walked up all mm. and it went from mm. there and that was probably last June or mm. July, yeah, something like that. Mm. So, so kind of meant to be really that you, you, you found each other. Did you feel you needed support, Yvonne? I think it'd be, it's nice to get involved with other people who've been have had breast cancer as well because when you go for chemotherapy and everything it's a bit sort of daunting because you don't know mm. what's going to happen with the radiotherapy because you're just on your own in a sense mm. and it's just nice to get involved with other people who have mm. had breast cancer or are looking to try and help people mm. and to make people more aware as well mm. you see sort of thing. I just wanted to be there to help other mm. people. And it's something as well that affects men isn't it? 
Monica, yeah, so not, not as much as women, no. obviously. I think in the is it QE, quite rare? Yeah, I think in the mm. QE hospital, um, it's possibly two to three mm. a month that they see. Mm. Obviously, with women, it's a, it's much more. Mm. Yeah, I was prevalent. looking at the statistics for men. You know, it's four hundred men are diagnosed yeah. every year. Every year, yeah. You know, and again, but I don't think men realise well, that they can I didn't have realize breast cancer. Yeah, I didn't realise myself when yes. I went uh, with yeah. my friend Carol. I yes. didn't even think men could get breast yes. cancer. And we found that out when we went. Yes, so again, the oncologist. do you think there's enough? I mean, it's, cancer is one of those awful diseases mm -hmm. that one of us or one of our friends will, sure. know, will surely know somebody who's been affected by it. Do you think there's still more to be done? Very much so. I mean, mm. I would like to get into schools mm. uh, at sixth form level and start telling the girls that they should, you know, if there's any history in the family, especially, to really start looking after themselves. Mm. Um, and I think it is all about awareness. Mm. But again, we're only a small voluntary charity. We're desperate for volunteers mm. and we keep the money in the community. We're mm. the only regional breast cancer charity in the UK. And I was very passionate about raising funds in the Midlands that stays in the Midlands. Oh, so all the people, all the money that's donated mm -hmm. is stays in the West yeah, Midlands? Yeah, we're all volunteers. That was another criteria mm. of mine, that we're all volunteers and all the money stays mm. in the Midlands to help the women of the Midlands. So you work with the QE, Veronica, is that, is that right? Yeah, the reason we started with the QE is because mm. my friend was being treated there, so it's the obvious place mm. to start from. Mm. And because it covers a 70-mile radius of the Midlands, we've put over a million pounds worth of equipment into the hospital, complementing the NHS. And unbeknown to me at the time, that has meant, talking to the staff there, that they've attracted um, the best doctors and the best nurses because they've got the best equipment. So people come from other hospitals mm. to use this equipment because it's the only hospital that, that has it in the region. Is that important? I mean, when you were having your treatment, Yvonne, was that important, do it you was, think? Uh, yes. I mean, I didn't know at the time, mm. but I do the, the chairs mm. that ladies fighting breast cancer that we use when you have chemotherapy. Mm was sort of like partly contributed through that. And tell us about those. What, what's they're so very different? Nice, they're nice, well, pink, pinky chairs. Yes, <laughs> pink course, is good. Of course. course. <laughs> very comfy. Very and pink everything. today. Yes, mm. yeah. That's it, yeah, very comfortable. And is that, does that really make a difference well, it does to your treatment? You can, it's, it's, some people are there for a long time, mm. so you need to be comfy mm. if you're sitting mm. and everything mm. and that, you see. So, I mean, my, my, I was only there for probably an hour, mm. an hour and a half. But, as I say, it makes all the difference mm. if you... And, and when you're now working with the charity, Veronica, how, how do you see the charity moving forward? Well, for 13 years, we just raised equipment for the QE. Mm. Um, and then the doctor retired. And I never used to go to the QE. And, and what I would say is I never used to go to the QE because I thought I was, one, taking up his precious time that was helping people. Um, and when he retired, I went to speak to the QEHB charities because there's two trusts at that hospital. Oh, yeah. And since we've married up with the QEHB on a million pound appeal, they have now allowed us to go into the atrium. Um, we're seeing patients, uh, which we never had access to before. And so for the charity to move forward, we also want to get into communities because mm -hmm. there's certain communities, unfortunately, that don't take up their mammogram uh, mm -hmm. appointments. Mm -hmm. So if we can engage with people from their own communities mm -hmm. to talk on our behalf and, mm -hmm. and come in with the, the charity, we will guide them. And then hopefully, you know, like, like mm -hmm. Ab said before, early detection saves lives. Mm -hmm. So it's educating people that there is equipment out there for them to go and use and hopefully we can why do you think that better. people don't take up the manogram it can be cultural is it cultural it can be cultural. i think they're probably scared yeah scared scared of what might be mm. Mm. scared of what they might say mm. to them so it's that fear maybe yeah so you your charity is hoping to sort of change that we're hoping to like i say if we can get out to uh, different areas of mm. birmingham and do what we would class as satellite mm. units mm. under our ladies fighting breast cancer banner if you like mm. and then let the communities themselves talk to their people and explain mm. the necessity of going and getting these mm. uh, mammograms or just going to your doctor if the earliest concern you've got just go to your doctor because it mm. does make a massive difference. So, uh, you would say that early detection makes well, yeah. all the without question. Yes. Mm. Without question yeah. Yeah. So tell me Yvonne, what's your role now in the, in the charity? A volunteer coordinator. Fantastic. And what would that what would that do? Well, it's trying to recruit people to come and stand like we do at the ball ring mm -hmm. in the atrium, mm -hmm. um, packing shopping bags at Sainsbury's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, any any place if you need to. Sort and of do you try feel that's something you really want to do now, well, Yvonne? It is because I mean, from, from my point of view, I feel like I'm giving something back mm. then by mm. helping out. Mm. And then if I can talk to people, which mm. people like to have a little chat and. Mm. just to reassure them that there is sort of like life after these mm. things anyway. 
I think it's. I, do you think it helps when you talk to other people who are going through the same, you know, similar situation as you? Did that help you, Yvonne? I, I think yes. Yeah. It's best to talk mm. because, as they mm. feel quite a bit mm. on your own. Mm. Exactly. And it's nice to talk to people who have been through it as mm. well. Oh, that's great. And share sort of experiences. Mm. Well, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much, Monica, and for you, Yvonne. Thank you for coming and sharing Thank your you, stories Monica. today. It's pleasure. been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So I'd like to thank all of my guests joining me today on Cuppa TV. And if you would like to get in touch with us, you can join us on Facebook or Twitter at Big Centre TV or email the show. Thank you so much for watching. Come back and join us tomorrow. Bye-bye. Well, just to, it, It's about having this thing inside of you that just says, mm -hmm. you know, I'm never going to quit on myself mm -hmm. because if I quit on myself, who else is there going to be to help me? You know, I've got to first depend on me before anyone else can depend on me to be anywhere. And what sort of um, groups do you speak to? Is it young children or is it adults? Who do you speak yeah, to? Yeah, I, sp I speak to colleges. South and City Birmingham College is one that I've, I'm, I work with very closely. Mm -hmm. I, I work with football clubs. Mm -hmm. Um, I've done a speech just before Christmas oh, for so a football club. Oh, so that brings club. in your football, your love of yeah, football. Yeah. Yes, that's it. And I'm also trying to potentially break into the boxing remit as well, maybe get talking to, yes. to some boxers, maybe be in a changing room before a mm. fight and get them really pumped up and give um, them that edge. And what's the relationship like with your father now? Pastors? Absolutely fantastic. Oh, that's because, you see, the, the thing is, my father was never to blame for, for my situation. I take full responsibility for that because my father never knew the situation. And in actual fact, when he found out, true extent just recently of what I actually went through. Yeah.